Let's do a good job of welcoming everybody in Montgomeryville and online as well. Come on, Journey Church. What's up, everyone? We got a lot to celebrate today. Isn't Baptism Sunday awesome? If you don't leave this Sunday soaking wet, something didn't happen. It's like going on a water ride, right? My butt's wet from sitting on a seat over there. I almost fell when I walked up here. It's a miracle that I made it here without falling. But it's been an amazing, amazing day. I want to show you a picture of a, of a couple that got... So there's all sorts of stories, right? Every, every person who gets into this tank up here in Montgomeryville represents a story. Every story is significant to God because it represents somebody that Jesus uh, loves and died on the cross for. But I want to show you something that happened today in, in second service. So this is Maness in April. This is, they, 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 they just got married on Thursday at, at Journey Church. And so a little background of the story, they've been together for 12 years and started coming to Journey a few, few months back. I have a little daughter and uh, they, they got saved at home group. So if you're not in a home group, I know they just ended for this semester. They'll start again in the fall. Good stuff happens in, in home group. Show me your people you're hanging out with. I'll show you your future, right? So they were going to home group uh, with John, at the Johnsons. John, John and Joy Johnson gave his life to Christ uh, a few weeks ago or a few days ago, whatever, and then came in on Thursday and said, we've been together for 12 years. We're getting baptized on Sunday. But before I do, I need to get married on Thursday. Uh, and so they called me up. We got, to, we got to marry them right out there in the lobby, got pictures, got to send them out on a, on a little, little honeymoon date. The rest is, is, you know, they can talk about to you. And so, uh, but just a, listen, isn't, that's what church is all about, amen? amen. That's, why we, that's why we give. That's why we serve. That's why we built the church that we built so that people that feel far from Christ can come in here and feel at home from the moment they get here. And what's interesting is he came here for a few months, uh, but it's not like he gave his heart to the Lord right away. It was, it was a process. And so uh, that, that's a really cool truth because a lot of you are just a work in, we're all just a work in process, right? We're all taking steps to fo follow Christ. So some of you, you're new to your faith. Some of you have been following Christ for a long time. And man, we're going to talk about the Bible and you've heard this story. Others of you have never been to church before ever. This is the first time you've ever been to church and you're like, okay, I'm here. How much longer is this going to last? So I got 30 minutes and then we got another service, but we're going to open up the Bible. We believe it's God's word. And uh, even if you don't follow Christ, I think you're going to get something from, t from today's message because I'm going to talk about something that I think all of us struggle with. So if you've been here, we've been talking through the different stories of, of men in the Bible that, that were kind of wild, kind of, uh, kind of did some crazy things for the Lord. And so last week we talked about Samson, right? Samson's the strongest man that had ever lived. We talked about how he fell. He had an extremely strong muscles, right, and a strong body, but a really weak will, right? And so uh, we talked about how to develop a strong will for God so that you can keep going. Today I want to talk to you about a young man named Jeremiah. Jeremiah started, uh, came on the scene in 627 BC. So Jesus comes, right? This is 627 years before Jesus was born. Uh, make a long story short, any time that God's people, the, the Israelites, found success, they always wandered away from the Lord. And so God would send them people because he was gracious, because he promised them, if you don't follow me, stuff's going to go bad for you. If you don't seek me, if you begin to worship other gods, stuff will go go bad for you, right? And, and I think you see that in our own lives. When you take your eyes off of Christ and apathy sets in, stuff tends to go haywire in your life. You deal with anxiety, a lack of peace. You, you deal with worry and doubt and anger and bitterness. This is what happens outside of the covering of the presence and the call of God in your life. And so God would call prophets. And so I, I think sometimes we think God calls older people to do things for him. So if you're a younger person in here, a couple things. I hate you, number one. And number two... <laughs> Uh, number two, you're not too young to be used by God. In fact, my favorite moment was, was in baptism was, was of an 11-year-old, I believe. He's probably 11, maybe going on 12. And they said, they said, who's your Lord and Savior? We always ask people who your Lord and Savior is. We want to make sure you got that right before we baptize you. And, so, and he said, Jesus. And I was like, that's right, man. Let's go change the world. And I just love the fact that God is speaking to young people. That's a promise in Scripture that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on your sons and daughters, right? So they're not the church of tomorrow. So he comes to Jeremiah and he says, you're next. I need you to go speak to my people on my behalf. Jeremiah chapter one, verse number four says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, uh, before you were even born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations, right? You've heard that. If you've gone to child dedication, right? You've heard that. Like before you were born, God had a plan for your life. He says this, alas, sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. 
Why are you sending me? Find somebody old, more seasoned, right? A veteran. But the Lord said, do not say you're too young. You must go to everyone I send, send you to and say whatever I command you. That's your job. You're going to go where I tell you to go. You're going to say what I tell you to say. If I could sum up what it means to follow Christ, boom, there it is. He, he leads you. He'll open up doors you can never open up. He'll give you the words to speak that you didn't know were even inside of you. That's what it means to follow the Lord. The Bible then says uh, in verse number 14, you skip down a few verses. I'll tell you why in a second. He tells him what he wants him to say, right? This is where it gets a little sketchy. He says, here's what the Lord wants me to say. From the north, disaster is going to be poured out on this land. I'm about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms. The kings will come and set up thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, and they'll come against all of the surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I'm going to pronounce my judgment on my people because of their wickedness and forsaken me, burning incense to other gods. That's a border town thing. Incense to other <laughs> gods. And, you know what I'm talking about? And in worshiping what their hands have made. They, instead of worshiping me, they have a piece of wood in their, their house that they're worshiping. Some of you say, that's weird. We do that all the time. You might not have a little, little God, but you might have a little car. Or you might have a little kid that you worship more than God. You worship these things you've created with your own hands more than you worship the one, one true God. Because of that, destruction is coming if you don't change. And then he tells them, go. Go. And for the next 40 years, this young 20-year-old prophesies to a people that would not listen to him. In fact, if you read the Bible, he, he, he obviously wrote the book of Jeremiah, but he also wrote the book of Lamentations, was, which was as the result of them being unrepentant and God coming and doing what he said he was going to do. And he has to be a witness. Lamentations means sorrow. He writes a, a book on sorrow as he watches his people in exile and his land that he grew up in destroyed. 40 years. And here's what's interesting. He works for 40 years for the Lord. You know how many people listen to him? Two. He preached for 40 years, and only two people ever responded and repented. To which that's a sermon. There's, there's, a two, there's two or three sermons that I had in my heart when it came to Jeremiah. And, and, and I want to make this point to you because it's really important, right? Because oftentimes we think success equals results, right? But, but results are God's job in your life. And the first thing you need to understand about the life of Jeremiah that you should apply to your own life is your life in following God is all about obedience, not outcome. You are to be obedient to whatever he calls you to do because sometimes success with God looks like addition and sometimes it looks like subtraction. You see, we often will teach people healthy things grow but if you got married and you've grown since you got married in the waste department are you healthy so you're like oh snap he did that right it's just reality right you would say no you you subtract let me give you a more less offensive one uh, more true though if you go to the doctor and they say you have a mass somewhere in your body that's growing that's not a sign of health what you want to do then is you want to go get go get treatment and you want them to tell you what that mass is it's subtracting, it's shrinking. So you need to remember in your own life, results will always be God's, God's decision. Your job is obedience, not outcome. But that's not what the Lord led me to speak. And I actually want to talk about something that I think destroys and takes more people away from the fullness of God in their life than maybe anything else. And I want to show you what I'm talking about. If you go back to Jeremiah chapter 8, here's what he tells him. You're going to say these things, and in verse number 8, I want you to not be afraid of them, for I am with you and you will rescue me. Anytime the Lord's telling you to not be afraid, there's something to be afraid of. What's he trying to say? They're going to be upset with you. You're going to speak to people and you're going to tell them things they don't want to hear. They're living in their apathy right now. But destruction is coming for them if they don't change. And so I need you to remember something as you're speaking to them and they're not listening to you. Don't be afraid of them. And then he tells them one more time in the book of, uh, of Jeremiah 1, verse number 17. He says, get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them or I will terrify you before them. How are you going to get ready? You're going to figure this one thing out that way too many of us are slave to. We're slave to people. I want to talk to you on the topic of being a people pleaser. Being, being a people pleaser, and, and here's why. 
if, if success with God is always about obedience, not outcome, there might be even a greater message in the story of Jeremiah that might sound like this. Becoming obsessed with what other people think about you is the fastest way to forget what God thinks about you and what he's called you to. Becoming obsessed with what everybody thinks. And, and listen, we struggle with it or there would be no such thing as social media. Social media would not have a platform in our lives if all of us don't struggle with being a people pleaser because what you did, God already saw when you did it. You don't need to put it up for him to like it. You don't need to go back and check it. You don't need to take four more pictures to make sure you look good in it. He already saw your heart. He didn't only see you, he saw your heart in it. We struggle with being a people pleaser. So let me just walk you through this because it's, it's, really, it's really significant. Number one is this, is most people I know struggle with this and don't even know it. Most people I know, myself included, we struggle with being a people pleaser and we don't even know it. And here's what's so significant. One of the hardest steps to becoming all that God wants you to be is figuring out that you don't have to be all that other people want you to be. One of the hardest steps in your life, those of you who just got baptized, those of us that are following Christ, some of us have been following Christ for a long time, one of the hardest steps in our lives is understanding that we don't have to be all that everybody else wants us to be. We just need to be all that God has called us and created us to be. And some of you, you're elbowing your neighbor about being a people pleaser. You need to stop elbowing them. You need to lean into this because you might struggle with it and you don't even know it. So what I want to do, I want to give you a pie. I know school's out, most of us. If you're still in school, man, that sucks for you, right? And so, but most of us are out of school, and uh, we're in summer vacation. But I want to give you a little pop quiz, both here in Montgomeryville online. If you answer yes to any of these questions I'm about to ask you, you struggle with being a people pleaser. N number one is this. Do you tend to take most criticism personally? Do you tend to take most, yes, I do. Right? Like, I, I, I want to act like I don't care what people think about me, and I don't care what people say about me, and I don't care what people, how people look at me, and I don't care about these things. But the truth is, if you were to really dig into my heart, of course I struggle with criticism. In fact, a couple, couple years ago, somebody came to our church, an older, an older woman, and I don't want to say super old, uh, but an older woman and her husband came. And they, they came in, and then I, I saw them in the, the last service. They were in the lobby, and I was walking out, and we, we were making small talk. And, and she said to me, she said, that was, that was pretty good, right? Anybody, anytime somebody says, pretty good? That means something bad is coming after that, right? And so it was pretty good. That was, that's like when you say, that was a good try, right? And so, and so she said, pretty good. I said, oh, good. She said, I, she said How many, can I give you some words of, uh, of critique, which is criticism, right? That's all I heard. And she says, listen, when you're preaching, you always go to the left, right? But I'm on the right now, if you're watching. You always go to the left, and you never go to the right. You spend way too much time on this side of the room, and you don't spend enough time on this side of the room. To which I wanted to tell her, that's because that is my good side, right? And so <laughs> I did it. But that, and so that's where, that's, and she just, just kind of walked away. And I, I would like to say, oh, man, I took it to heart, and I'm on the right side. See me, I'm on the right side. What I did is get on the internet, look her up on Facebook build a case of why that she doesn't know what she's talking about and move on right <laughs> come on because we take criticism personally we, 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 we do we, we struggle in that area do you feel number two do you feel an extraordinary fear of rejection D do you feel an extraordinary fear of rejection are you afraid to say what you need to say because you don't want to be alone are you afraid for your kids because they're going to be different. If you send them there or you allow them to go through this, are you afraid that they'll be rejected? Right? Not understanding that isolation is often where God bursts things in you to begin something great through you. Do you have a fear of being truthful with your parents because you don't want to be the weird brother or sister? Do you have a fear of rejection at your work where you won't share the truth that sets people free because you're afraid they might reject you? You have a problem with being a people pleaser. Number three, do you have a hard time expressing your true feelings? I'm not talking about online. I'm talking about face to face. Everybody's tough online. When you're with somebody, I do. If somebody's telling me something that, that, I, that I don't totally agree with or sometimes that I think is dumb, I catch myself saying to them, oh yeah, that's cool. If I ever say to you, that's cool, just so you know, what I'm thinking is, that is so dumb, what you're about to do. 
but I'm afraid to tell you that it's done because I don't want you to get mad at me. So that's cool. Why? Because I'm a people pleaser. I have an extreme fear of rejection. I don't like criticism. Number four, do you have a hard time? Here's a really important one. Saying no. Yeah, I do because Jesus always said yes. No, he didn't. In fact, he said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't give a yes with resentment. Give a no. Do you, do you have a hard time? No, I can't help you do this. I can't be there for that. I can't, I can't marry you at this time. I can't, I can't be at that function for you. I, I can't do that and do what I'm supposed to do. So no, I can't do it. And I can't tell them no. They'll be mad at me, right? If you answer yes to any of these, one of these, most of us, all of these, we struggle with being a people pleaser and we don't even know it. Why is it important? Because it takes you away from the call of God on your life. So let me just give you a few more thoughts on it. Number, number two is this, is you need to be aware in your life that you are always going to be disappointing someone. You, you are always, Jeremiah got the word of the Lord. If you read Jeremiah chapter 12, he hasn't even left his hometown and he's ready to give up. God told him, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna have a platform with kings. You're gonna, you're gonna, I'm going to use you in that, in that magnitude. Jeremiah 12, he hasn't even left his hometown, and he is just tired. He's overwhelmed. He doesn't want to do it anymore. And, and here's why. He realized everybody is disappointed with what I'm saying. They asked me to come back with some good news, and I just keep coming back with some bad news because they won't change. They asked me to come back and encourage them, and I keep telling them the truth of what God wants me to tell them. It, it's pretty repetitive. Change or it's going to be bad. Get it together or God's going to have to come get it together for us. Can you just give us good news? No, I can't because this is what God's wanting me to say. I'm supposed to say what I'm supposed to say and go to who I'm supposed to go to. But Jeremiah 12, he's quickly realized, man, somebody is always disappointed with me. In fact, Paul says this, hundreds of years later, leader just like Jeremiah was, Galatians chapter 1. He says this in verse number 10. He says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings? You should highlight that. Am I trying to win the approval of human beings? Listen, take it down for one second. God does not care how much influence you have on this earth if it's outside of his truth. I don't care how many people watch your YouTube stuff. I don't care how many people like your stuff. If it's outside of God's truth, you're trying to win the approval of human beings, right? He says this, or am I trying to please people? You can bring it back up. Sorry, that was kind of rude of me. Can you please bring it back up? If I was still trying to please people, what does he say? I would not be a servant of Christ. I can either be a servant of Christ at the expense of pleasing other people, or I can please other people and I can't be a servant of Christ. But did you see the dynamic? Somebody is always going to be disappointed. You can either have God disappointed in you or man disappointed in you. Somebody is always going to be. In fact, I taught this leadership principle because as a leader, I began to realize this. Like in church, it's the weirdest thing. You can get a hate email and a love email on the same day, the same hour. You can have one person telling you, you are the worst pastor I've ever had. You're shallow. You're arrogant. You're this. And then you get another email and it says, you, your church, I don't want to say you, your church has literally changed my life. The message you preached last week that just got crit criticized and was the worst thing I've ever heard, that literally opened my eyes up and has impacted my life. And you think to yourself, what, which one is it? And it's what I call the hero and the heel paradigm. All of us want to be the hero in our lives, right? But you are both all the time. You are always a hero in the heel. Some of you don't know what a heel is. If you grew up in my, my, my time when I was a kid, wrestlers were, where there was good guys and there was bad guys, right? And you didn't want, you didn't worship or like bad guys. They got it wrong later on, right? But you remember old school wrestling. It was Hulk Hogan and a heel or macho man randy savage and and a heel you didn't get those two fighting and am i preaching right unless you paid for pay-per-view and watched it later on right and some of you have no idea what i'm talking about but the bad guys were heels nobody ever wanted to be a heel right except this generation like i love i love this guy he's all, i'm like no he's a bad guy right and so the hero and the heel let me let me give you an example i, I've, I had sports sports guys that I love growing up, men, men that to me hung the moon, right? That you had their posters on their wall. As I've gotten older, I've realized a lot of those guys that played sports that I obsessed over uh, were awful husbands and fathers. 
So at the same time that they're my hero, I'm worshiping the ground that they walk on, their kids and their wife are saying, you're an absolute heel. You're a hero in a heel. You got to pick which one. You get to pick the part in it. You got to pick which one. If you, have a, if you have a teenager right now, is it not true you are a hero and a heel at the same time? If your teenager ain't telling you, you hate, he hates you or she hates you, you're ruining your life, you ain't parenting right. Right? But sometimes I remember my parents making a decision that impacted my life in that moment because the decision that I was going to make was going to ruin my future forever. And they were a heel to me in the present so they could be a hero to me in the future. Right? Like this happens all the time. Jesus was perfect, yet he faced rejection. He, he faced disappointing people. One, one time, a man with a shriveled hand came to Jesus on the Sabbath, on the day they worshiped God, and he healed the man's hand. And the guy was excited, and Jesus was a hero to this man. But at the same time, the religious people were mad because he healed his hand on the Sabbath. He's a hero and a heel at the exact same time. And the reason I'm trying to teach you this it's because some of you, you just, you just cannot function if somebody is mad at you. You, you, just, you, you, just, you just cannot, but you need to understand in every situation, in every decision, you are making a decision to be a hero in the heel, both at the same time. And it's really important and it's really significant because at some point you need to make peace with the fact that everyone is not going to like you all the time and that's okay. Most people don't even like themselves. A few years ago, I went to SeaWorld. I think SeaWorld is the most underrated amusement park in the history of the world, right? I've been to all of them, Disney World, uh, uh, Universal, Dorney Park, right? I got a history at Dorney Park, and so I can talk about that some other time. And uh, I got, I've been to all of them, right? SeaWorld, the most underrated park. It has, it's like going to a zoo with rides, right? And it's a like good ride. It's not like Disney World rides. You know what I'm talking about? Where you wait in line for six hours, and you're like, that's it. Peter Pan just sits there and you, you know, you know what I mean? Like you're like, that's it, right? Unless you have little kids, you're like, that was dumb. And so, but like SeaWorld, really good rides. The last ride of the night at SeaWorld a couple years ago was the flume ride. Last time I've been on the flume ride, I was five years old with my mom and dad. I had pictures of it. I literally, they were the heels in that moment. Took me on this flume ride, got me soaking wet. You know, I've had to go to counseling for it, like all this stuff. So I was like, I'm gonna go back on the, I'm gonna take my kids. And I'm going to do to my boys what my parents did to me on that flume ride. And so we wait in this line, me, my mom, and my sons. Last ride of the night, it's kind of dark, kind of, kind of getting colder. I'm like, let's go on this flume ride. And I start to get in line, and I start to, to, to do some scientific research. And here's what I wanted to figure out. Which seat do you sit in where you don't get wet? Because <laughs> that's the seat I want to be in, and I want to watch my boys get soaking wet and cry like I did, you know, 40 years ago, right? And so... So I, I study, wait in line, I'm watching people get on the ride, get off the ride, and, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, okay, I, I, I thought I figured it out, scientifically proven. Here's the seat you get in, one of them tried to sit on, no, you get off, that's my seat. And so I pushed him over, and I sat on the seat, and a little bit into the ride, you know what I realized? You get wet on every seat in the flume ride. <laughs> there, was the, there was not a dry, it was false advertising, right? Like every seat you sat in, it doesn't matter, you get soaking wet, and I'm just trying to tell you, listen, if you're going to live your life for Christ, or really outside of Christ, everybody gets wet with criticism. Everybody has people disappointed in them. All the time, somebody will be out there that's disappointed in you. That somebody will be mad at you for living for the Lord in a way that you're living and not pleasing them and doing what they want you to do. And so you need to get used to that. You need to make peace with that. Let me just give you a few more thoughts. Number three, people pleasing then at its finest. I got a piece of paper right here. I got to get this that's problems. And so uh, people pleasing, I won't be able to preach if it's right there, is really, <laughs> it's just issues, man. And so I felt it and it just messed me up and I won't be able to keep going if it's there. And so people pleasing is, is really just idolatry, right? At the, at the core of it, I want to explain to you what idolatry is. I, idolatry is anything you think about, fear, or spend more time on than God. The Bible says not to have any graven images, not to have idols in your life, not to allow things to be more important, right? And, and maybe you don't struggle with, with a statue in your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your home where you go home and you burn incense to it. That'd be, that'd be weird to you. Like, I would never do that. But some of you, you, you struggle with the worship of people. You, you worship them for what they can give to you. You, 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 want, you want their affirmation. You, 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 you want their respect. You want their approval. You want all that, even at the expense of disappointing God. 
Because you can't do both oftentimes. Like how many times would making a decision to be fully bought into your faith cost you in an area? And I see it all the time. I see it with my kids in travel sports. I see it with people in events on Sunday morning. They're like, yeah, my, my family doesn't understand, you know, my, me going to church. And so I just want just to just make sure they're, they, they're okay and blah, blah, blah. I'm thinking when your family does hit rock bottom because they will, they're not going to know where to turn because you're right there with them. So, so make, make a stand. And like you just get to the point where, and you don't understand, but the truth is being a people pleaser is really just have an idolatry in, in your heart. In fact, that's what Jesus said about the Pharisees. One time in John chapter 12, he says, he says these Pharisees secretly began to want to follow Christ, right? Because that's how we are with our faith. It's kind of secretive. Secretly, but they didn't want to le- lose their place in the synagogue, right? And so you could take that out. You, you didn't want to lose your place in the company. You didn't want to lose your place in your friendship circle. You didn't want to lose your place in your club at school. And watch what he says in verse number 43. He says, for they love human praise more than the praise from God. They love human praise more than the praise for God. And here's the problem. The Bible says fear of man, idolatry, is like a snare in your relationship with God. It eventually pulls you away. How does it pull you away? I'll give you a couple. The I'll compromise hook. The, the I'll compromise hook. I'll, I'll compromise. I'll, 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 I'll live a little bit for the Lord and I'll live a little bit for the world. I'll, I'll live fully committed to the Lord for this part and then I'll live semi-committed because I want to keep them happy and I'll, and I'll compromise the I'll compromise hook let me let me give you another hook that I see people making the I'll over commit for you hook I'll commit 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 I'll commit to doing this on Sunday I'll commit to doing this at the expense of of me working and serving I'll commit at the expense of my family I'll commit because I just want you t- to love me right I, I, the other hook is I'll let you limit my success hook let me let me tell you something the more that the Lord uses your life, the more criticism that you will face. The more that the Lord wants to use your life, the bigger your platform, the more critical. How do I know that? Who do you criticize the most? The nobody at your job that doesn't ever talk? Oh, look at him. You criticize the person that's above you. I would do a much better job if I had the opportunity. You criticize the president. I would do a much better job if I had the opportunity, right? You, you, you criticize the teacher. You criticize the coach. We, we, always, we could always do a better job if I had the opportunity. Well, there's a reason you don't have the opportunity. You probably can't handle it. So, so here's the thing. We overcommit. We compromise, right? We, we idolize. And so here's the question then because it's like, well, what do you do? Because sometimes you have a message like, well, how do you wrap this up? Well, what do you do with that? Drop the mic, walk off the stage. So I want to show you a verse in scripture because I was like, well, how did, I, how did Jeremiah do it? For, 40 years, nobody listened. Everybody hated him. He got beat up. He got made fun of, right? He, he never got married. God told him, don't, don't, get, don't get married. Like, and he, he, just, he just, if you look at his life, you're like, man, he lived a life filled with suffering. How, how did he do it? And I stumbled on this verse this week, and here, here, here's what it said in Jeremiah 6, verse number 10. He says, to whom can I speak and give warning? Who's going to listen to me? I mean, he's preaching. His, his crowds are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They're going down to the other church. Nobody's listening. He says their ears are closed. And they can't hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them, and they find no pleasure in it. Right? But he says this in verse number 11. He says, but I'm full of the wrath of the Lord, and I cannot hold it in. If there was ever a verse that you should get tattooed on your arm, it's that one. But I'm full of of the wrath of the Lord. And I just can't stop talking about it. What's he saying? Well, I I did some study. I'm like, was he mad? No, when he was 20 years earlier, he had been shown the outcome of the disobedience of his people. And he was obsessed with making sure they knew what was to come. And he couldn't stop talking about it. Some of you, you can't really tell anybody about Jesus. You can't ever stand up for your faith. You can't stand for truth. You, you waver. You hide. You know it's not popular. You're a people pleaser at, at its finest. You're like, I don't know what to do. What's the best antidote for that? I don't know how to fix it. Is there a book? Is there a counselor? Is there something like that? And the best antidote for the fear of people is the fear of God. Let, let, me, let, me, let me just break this down for you because I started to contemplate it this week. Why are there some people that are so passionate about their faith? Why is there some people that they can talk about Jesus to anybody and they're not afraid? 
Why is there some people that can do it? And even when somebody says no, they're okay, they move on. They just keep talking about it. Well, the wrath of the Lord has disturbed their life. Some of you say, what's the wrath of the Lord? Well, the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So let me just, the people who got baptized today, uh, they're not good people. That's not, that's not what they're, we're not celebrating their goodness today. Look at us, I'm in water. What we're celebrating is a good God that saved them by grace, amen? amen. This room is not filled with good people. In Montgomeryville, you're not sitting by good people. I am not a good person. I'm just, I'm just outside of Christ. You, I've already told you how I'd be. I'd cheat, I'd steal, I'd do whatever I needed to do to get ahead because this is all that I have, right? But with Christ, I'm a child of God, adopted into his family. I'm saved and secure. I get grace and mercy. He offers me peace. He offers me purpose. The Bible says that all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. It says the wages of our sin is death and hell. How many of you know that that's not very popular to tell somebody? I'm a good person. Well, let's just go through the list. Have you ever lied? Yes. Have you ever lusted? Yes. Have you ever stolen? Probably. Dorney Park for me, uh, multiple times. <laughs> have you ever cheated? I, 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 have, you, have you been bitter? I mean, you're full of sin. The Bible says the wages of your sin, the payment of your sin is death and hell. All of us. What's hell like? Hell is separation from God forever. That means you don't go to a better place. You go to an awful place, a place of suffering, the Bible says. The Bible says a place filled with fire and darkness and hopelessness. That's a real place, the Bible says. All of us deserve it. Every one of us, if you're listening to my voice. But it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. For anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you know what it also says? After you're saved, how can other people know if you don't say anything? What if you're not sent to them? And so the Bible was really clear. Your job is to go into all the world and preach the gospel, telling everybody about this Jesus. See, the greatest tragedy on this, this side of eternity is somebody living and dying without Jesus. I know the news tells you there's other tragedies. There's other agendas. There's other significant things. And those things are, are maybe important, I guess. But the greatest tragedy is somebody in your work, in your family, in your, in your company, in your school, living and dying without knowing Jesus because the Bible says when their heart stops beating, it's too late. So, the wrath of the Lord has disturbed me. And I am more obsessed with the truth that I believe is to come for people's lives outside of Christ than I am worried about offending them. I refuse to have somebody live by me, hang out with me, and one day say, why didn't you ever tell me? Because I didn't want you to like me. I didn't want you to think I was weird or dorky. Why? Because I was obsessed with your approval. See, the greatest antidote to being a people pleaser is the fear of the Lord. You either believe it, listen, or you don't. It's either 100% true or this is 100% dumb what we believe. You either go all in or you go all out. And I'm just going to go back to the first point. So I'm like, well, I have invited people, but they don't come to church. And I have done this, and now I'm scared. And now, now I don't want to say nothing, and they've made fun of me. Listen, listen. Obedience is your job, not outcome. God's job is results. O obedience. I'm going to share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm here to please God, not man. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet all over our houses. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Why is this so important? Because too many of us struggle with it. When we don't get it right, our world suffers. When we don't get it right, our world suffers. Our family suffers. Our friends suffer. Our coworkers suffer. Our schoolmates suffer. Our teammates suffer. Why? The greatest tragedy is somebody living and dying without Jesus. Don't miss it. The Bible talks about living in darkness. The Bible talks about having blindness anxiety fear being overwhelmed being broken being hopeless trying to build your identity in this world living for the applause of people constantly running never being satisfied that's what life feels like outside of god constantly earning never having enough accomplishing a constantly accomplishing but it never never fulfilling you to the to the point where you thought it would some of you know that because you're here today you're like i did everything that i was supposed to do 
and I still live with this utter emptiness inside of me. Old pastors would say that's because you have a God-sized shape in your heart that only can be filled by Him. And you've tried to fill it with, with success and fill it with people and relationships and, and possessions and power. And only Jesus can do it. Only Jesus can fulfill you. So if you're in this place, maybe you've never been to church before. Nobody's looking around. Everybody's got their own stuff to deal with. If you're looking around right now, that might be question number five. You're probably people pleaser. Because <laughs> you're worried what other people are thinking. Nothing weird is going to happen. I'm not going to squirt water on you. I, I just want you to get rid of any, any distraction you may have. And I want you not to worry about the person to your right or left. Because uh, they got their own problems, their own issues, their own, their own situations. We're not, we're, not, we're not all perfect in here. But maybe, maybe you know, like as I was speaking today, you know, man, I don't have a relationship with God. Like, um, my life, I'm not satisfied. Like, I, I don't have peace, and I, and I don't have joy. And you talk about anxiety, I am, I am literally overwhelmed with anxiety. Anxiety, by the way, is an awareness that you're not in control. That's what anxiety is at its simplest. It's, a, it's an over-awareness that you are not in control, which by the way, you're not. Your heart can stop beating at any moment. But here's the thing, God is. And you can have a relationship with Him. You can trust Him, you can follow Him, you can invite Him into your life. What's so cool is He doesn't say, come and fix yourself up and I'll take you. He says, come to me if you're weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. It's one decision. It's one moment. It's one yes. What are you saying yes to? John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world, that's you, that's me, that he gave up his one and only son, that's Jesus Christ, died on a cross for our sins, was put in a tomb, and on the third day, he rose in power. He gave up his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have the promise of everlasting life. It means when I take my last breath here, my next breath will be with Jesus in heaven. Not because I'm a good person, but because I chose to be a saved person. I receive Christ as my Lord and my Savior. So, so I guess what I, what I want to do is I want to slide that gift towards you today. I want to I offer you that, that decision that, that many of us have made. The decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. The Bible says if you would confess with your mouth and you would believe in your heart, that Jesus is who he said he is, that he died like he said he died, and that he rose in power, that through Jesus Christ, that you'll become a brand new person. You'll become a brand new person. Whether you're old in this place, and you've lived a long life, or you're young, and this is, this is fairly new to you, or maybe you've been to church before, maybe you've never been to church before, wherever you're at, if you will call on the name of Jesus, both here, Montgomeryville, and even online, Jesus come into my life. So I'm gonna ask you to do something in a second. I think following Christ takes courage. That's just me. I think if you look at the life of Jeremiah, that if there was one more point, it was that dude had some serious courage. Only God courage. It takes courage to follow Christ. And so how you start something determines where you go from there. So I'm not going to make you come forward and I'm not going to call you out and everybody's head's bowed and everybody's eyes are closed, but I'm going to ask you to do one thing for me today. The Lord is speaking to you. The Bible talks about knocking at the door of people's hearts and you would say, man, I want Jesus to come into my life. As you've been speaking, he's been doing something and I just want to say yes to Jesus Christ. So that you all over this place in Montgomeryville, man, and I'm speaking to you and you're ready, you're ready, you're ready to give your life to Christ. When I ask you here in a second, unashamedly, with all the courage you can muster, I just want you to shoot your hand straight towards heaven. Say, hey, you're talking to me. You ready? God's speaking to me. I want a relationship with Jesus Christ right now all over this place in Montgomeryville. Would you just begin to shoot your hand straight towards heaven? Come on, there's a hand here already. Hand here, hand here. Hand, 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 hand. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Hand in the back. Yeah, a few more hands here. If you're in Montgomeryville, would you just place your hand towards heaven and say, hey, pastor, you're talking to me right now. I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Maybe you're online and you can't raise your hand, obviously, but can but we won't see you but you can type in the comments i want jesus to be the lord of my life i'm responding to the gospel we're just going to begin to pray uh, if you're not a praying person th there there is nothing uh extravagant about prayer it's just a, 
a person, a human, saying, I can't do this on my own anymore. God, come into my life. That's all you're saying. Jesus, I give you everything that I am right now. That's all you're going to say. Simple as that. Not long, drawn out, and religious. Let's begin to pray. Lord, we love you. But as, I, as we, we, we spent time in your word, the promise of scripture, it never returns void. So Lord, thank you for moving. Uh, thank you for drawing people to yourself. And thank you for giving us the courage to respond, Lord. But this is just the beginning. The best day of our life is the day that we realize that we, have, we need a savior. And we realize that you put us on this earth for something significant. So, Lord, would you begin to do what only you could do? Would you begin to change minds and hearts, Lord? Would you, would you shift people's uh, understanding of life and where they're going? Would you heal right now and make people whole? Would you set people free? Lord, right now, would you break somebody's addiction? Right now. They're never going to even want it again, Lord. Something's happening in your presence, and that's because the promise of Scripture says more can happen in one moment in you, with you than a thousands elsewhere. So Lord, thank you for what you're doing as we're speaking. You're filling these rooms with your presence and your power and people's lives are being changed forever. Lord, we love you and we thank you that we get to live for you. We're thankful that we get to serve you. We thank you that we got to celebrate with all these people today that made their faith public with you. Jesus, thank you for all that you've done. In your name that we pray. One more time, Journey Church. Come on, let's shout amen together. Let's make some noise for somebody in Montgomeryville and somebody online. Come on, let's clap. Thank you so much for joining us online. If you're new to watching with us, we want you to know you're the reason we stream today's services. We have teammates ready to reach out to you, so please take a second to fill out the online info card. We would love to get you connected to what's happening here at Journey Church and answer any questions you might have. And if you live near us, we would love to meet you in person. Please visit our website at jrny.church for more information about a visit. And if you don't live near us, that's okay. We would love to get you connected to a church in your area. Make sure you keep up with us by downloading the Journey Church app. Here you can view past message notes, keep up with Journey Kids, and find out what's next in your relationship with Jesus. Make sure you share this link with a friend and invite them to join you next Sunday. We look forward to seeing you then.